Okay, good to see you all back from a coffee break. And for those of you again out in television, we just want to welcome you to an informal Bible study. Now, I know I say it almost every program, but you've got to remember, new people coming in every day. And uh, we have to make them aware that uh, we're not just a bunch of kooks. <laughs> we just love to study the Word, and uh, it's catching on. My, I wish you could read our mail, which reminds me again, thank you for those of you out in television for your kind letters, your encouragement, and again, for your financial help. My, I get newsletters from several other ministries, and they're all crying for help, and they're cutting back, and uh, so far, so far, I just asked the girls again yesterday, how do we end up with the month of May? Right on. And uh, so that's all we can hope for. So again, thank you, every one of you out there, and then for your prayers. My goodness, prayer makes all the difference in the world. All right, right back where we left off in Daniel chapter 9. And uh, we were in verse 5, but I want to use it again because I've got a scripture reference that I'd like to bring in on this one. So if you're with me in Daniel chapter 9, verse 5, where Daniel is now in his prayer to Jehovah, we have sinned <clears throat> as the nation. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. All right, let's go back to... Second Chronicles, all the way back to the book of history, Second Chronicles, the last chapter. And that can be your crutch if you want to share these things with people. <coughs> the last chapter of Second Chronicles. And you can just jump in at verse 15. And we have exactly the scenario for which Daniel is praying forgiveness. Now, maybe this is an appropriate time to remind all of us. I know that what God says to Israel has no direct bearing on us today, except as we learn from it. But you know, as I've said before, when I taught Daniel way, way back in consort with Revelation, to a certain degree, we can set America right up beside all this. Even though we're not the chosen nation, we're certainly not Israel, but we have been so singularly blessed like no other nation under heaven has ever been blessed. And primarily because from day one, even though they may not have been totally born-again believers, but yet all the people responsible for making America get off the ground and became such a nation is because it was always God-centered. We were a God-fearing people. And I'll never forget, years ago, my dad was telling me that when he first, as a kid, 10 years old, they came up to our part of North Iowa, and it was still pretty much the frontier. But he rehearsed with me one day, we were talking about it, how that the first thing, not only the Baptists, but the Lutherans and the Methodists all got together, that they could build some kind of a building where they could share and hold their worship services. That was the most paramount thing. Not the bars, not the other garbage that Hollywood likes to make you think made up the West Frontier, but the first thing that was preeminent was a place of worship. And see, that was the mentality of America all the way up through our history. Now, granted, we had a lot of ungodly people along with it. But, you know, I'm always quoting Tocqueville, the French historian who traveled America, I think, probably, I don't remember exactly, but I think between 1900 and, and uh, World War II. And when he got back to France and wrote his book on history, he said, the reason America is so blessed is because America is populated by good people. Well, what made them good? Their worship. They're putting God at least in a place of reverence. All right, so I can't help but feel that we're going to come under the same kind of chastisement. In fact, I think Billy Graham, if I'm not mistaken, I don't like to quote people unless I'm sure, but I'm quite sure Billy Graham made the statement long time ago. I'm going to say way back in the early 80s. 
and he would be crying how fast we were going down the tube spiritually. And then he made this statement, unless America repents, Sodom and Gomorrah will rise up and tell God he's not fair. And so judgment is going to come, see? And uh, I have to feel this in the back of my thinking as I teach these things concerning God's dealing with a rebellious nation like Israel. Hey, we're going to come under that same wrath someday. And uh, I've said it before in the program. Uh, I'm not saying anything new. That when God judges America, it's going to be like no other nation has ever been judged. Because we have been given so much responsibility. Churches on every corner. You know, I shared with one of my classes here in Oklahoma. A couple of years ago, we were in a seminar in North Georgia, but we were staying with some people in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so as we left our host and hostess, why, the first thing we came up with a church. And I said, honey, Les, I'm going to start counting churches. Well, we hadn't gone four or five miles, and she was already up to like 24 or 25. And she says, I might as well quit. I can't keep up. But you see, this is typical in America. Churches on every corner, see? And so we have been given a tremendous responsibility as a nation of people. All right, but now here's Israel. Just shortly before the captivities begin, Second Chronicles chapter 36, and jump in with me at verse 15. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, that is the prophets, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people. He wanted to give them opportunity to repent, as we say more or less today, and to have a change of direction, see? And he had compassion on his people. Now, that's why I'm emphasizing all the time. Remember, this is God in Israel. This isn't God in the church. This isn't God in Gentiles. This is God in Israel. He's had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place, which, of course, is Jerusalem. But, but, that big flip side, they mocked the messengers of God. They despised his words, misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, Israel, until there was no remedy. Therefore, what's he doing? He brings in the Chaldees, the Babylonians, invading them, see? And so he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary. These Babylonians had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him, stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God, that is the temple now, remember, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king. And of his, he brought this all to Babylon, see? All right, now just drop over all the way down to verse 21. Now drop down to verse 21. All this to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, and I'm also going to add Moses, until the land, the promised land, Israel's homeland, until that land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as I explained in the previous half hour. Every seventh year was to be left fallow and out of production as a a uh, land sabbatical, but they didn't do it. And so the land enjoyed her Sabbath for as long as she lay desolate, 70 years, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and 10 years or the 70 years of the captivity. All right, now then we can come back to Daniel chapter 9, and I'm going to go into verse 6, and I've got yet another portion I want to take you to, and that'll be up in the New Testament. But let's stop in Daniel. Chapter 9 again, now verse 6. Daniel chapter 9, verse 6, so that you'll understand why Daniel is praying the way he is praying in chapter 9. Verse 6, Neither have we, the nation, hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets. See, I want you to understand that there were prophets throughout Israel constantly preaching and warning them of judgment to come. Now, you remember when we did a verse by verse on the book of Dan uh, Isaiah some time ago. I don't think it's even been on the air yet. 
<laughs> except on the weekends. But my goodness, what was Isaiah's complaint? The same thing. Turn from your idolatry. Turn from your rebellion, or you're going to have foreigners in your midst. Well, they didn't turn, and they got foreigners in their midst, see? All right, verse 6 again. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, who spoke in thy name to our kings. See? The upper echelon were just as guilty as the low man on the totem pole. He who spoke thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. What did they do with them? Now turn up with me to Acts chapter 7 and let the scriptures speak. Let the scriptures tell us what they did with them. Acts chapter 7. <clears throat> And here we have Stephen, the last opportunity for the nation of Israel at the time of Christ to yet repent of having crucified and rejected their Messiah and enjoy all the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. Here's their last chance. I always call this the crescendo, the music word. This is the crescendo of Israel's rebellion. This is when they came to the very peak of their adamancy. We will not succumb to this Jesus of Nazareth. All right, and so here we have Stephen now presenting their last opportunity. And always make note of the fact that when you get to the last verse or thereabouts in the first verse of chapter 8, we're introduced to the next major player because Israel is rejecting. All right, but Acts chapter 7, verse 51. And Stephen is addressing the religious leadership, remember, of the nation of Israel. And so to this religious leadership, he says, you stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears. Oh, they were circumcised in the flesh, but not were really counted in the realm of the spirit, see? Okay, stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Now watch it. As your fathers, your forefathers back there now in Isaiah's time and before, and your fathers did, so do you. Now look at verse 52. Which of the prophets, any of them that you could name, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them who showed before the coming of the just one. In other words, the very prophets that were promising the peace and prosperity and the glory of this earthly kingdom, they killed them. And you've heard me say it a hundred times on this program. If they didn't like the message, what'd they do? They killed the messenger. Even Israel, see? Okay, read it again. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain, put to death, them who showed before the coming of the just one, the Messiah. Of whom? Speaking of the Messiah. You have now been betrayers and murderers. That's what the book says. That's not what I say. It's scripture. And then look at the next verse. You who have received the law by the disposition of angels. Now that's kind of a tough one to explain because we know that the law was given to Moses, but there must have been an angelic force along with it. But you who have received the law, those Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God in stone. And you have not kept it, see? Why? Rebellion. Unbelief. In fact, I just had a call the other day from a lady that's writing a book. And she said, Les, I don't know who else. Come back to me, Daniel chapter 9. She said, I don't know who else to ask. Why did Israel reject the Messiah? Well, now you just think a minute. How would you answer that question? Why did Israel reject their promised Messiah? Well, I took her to Matthew 16. Now, let's look at it. This is Bible study. I'm not under any 
set order to cover such and such in 30 minutes. I took her back to Matthew 16, and I probably wouldn't rehearse it, but she was so thrilled with the answer, she couldn't say thank you fast enough. She said, this is exactly what I was looking for. I remember her question. Why did they reject Jesus as the Messiah? And this is a good place to go. We use it over and over. Matthew 16, starting at verse 13, at the end of his three years, just shortly before they go up for the Passover and the crucifixion. Verse 13, Jesus came into the borders of Caesarea Philippi, clear up there at the headwaters of the Jordan, remember? And he asked his disciples, nobody there but the twelve, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist. Some think you're Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. How ridiculous can you get? Now don't forget, what has he been doing every day for almost three years? Miracles. Miracles. And more miracles. And they haven't got a clue? No, they didn't have a clue. Except Peter. All right. And he said unto them, whom say you that I am? And then Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of the living God, to which Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. But see, this was Israel's problem then. It was Israel's problem back here. And what's the one word? Unbelief. Unbelief. Look at America today. What's our problem? What's the matter with Congress? They don't have a clue. They don't know how to handle the Middle East, except by lobbyists and pressure. Why not? Unbelief. They no longer put any value on the fact that this is the revealed Word of God. To most of, I think, even our men in Congress. It's just another book. No, it isn't. It's the Word of God. All right, are you back at Daniel chapter 9? So like I said, kind of lay America side by side here because this could be our prayer today. Although we're not under Israel's law, we're under grace, but yet we still have access to the Father. We have our absolute authority to pray on behalf of our nation and our leadership. Paul teaches it. And nothing, nothing in Scripture would oppose that. All right, so now read verse 6 again after reading Acts. Neither have we, the nation of Israel, hearken to thy servants and the prophets. In other words, they killed them or threw them in the dungeon. That's where Jeremiah was, remember, when the Babylonians found him. He was in a dungeon. And these who spoke in thy name to our king, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land... O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces that at this day to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel. Now, you know, I always have to keep hammered away at that because so much of even Christendom cannot get the fact through their head that all 12 tribes are still viable. Ten of them didn't get lost. Don't ever buy into that baloney. The ten tribes were never lost. They stayed as part of Israel, even into the captivities. And here is proof of it, see? And so it's to all those of Judah and Jerusalem, but also all Israel, the ten tribes, see? Those that are near, those that are far off, through all the countries where thou hast driven them, because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. Now stop and think a minute again. How far are we removed from that Babylonian invasion of 606 B.C.? About 75 years. That's a long time. So what had happened to a lot of these Jews that were transported from Jerusalem and Judea out to Babylon? Well, they began migrating, see? All through the then known Roman world. And I make the point because by the time we get to our New Testament, and especially now as we're looking at the little epistles of James and Peter and John in our New Testament, and they're addressing Jews in the synagogue, how did they get there? 
Well, they've been there for 600 years. Because as soon as they got transported to Babylon, they started getting involved in business and banking and so forth, and they started migrating, and so there were Jews scattered throughout the whole Roman Empire by the time of Christ. See? Let me show you. I've got to do everything with Scripture. Jump all the way up the New Testament. Get to Acts chapter 2. Now, this is the day of Pentecost. And this, again, is what most of Christendom just doesn't get. They just can't read it. Acts chapter, or is it chapter 1? No, oh, it's in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and drop down to verse 5. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. Now, I'm saying this in regard to history. 600 B.C. is when they were first emptied out of Jerusalem, and out of that whole nation of people that was taken captive, only 40-some thousand came back under Ezra. That's just a, a little smidgen. What happened to the rest of them? Well, they migrated all over the then known world, see? All right, but they still kept contact with the temple in Jerusalem. They still, if they were good, sincere Jews, would come back to at least one or two of the feast days. All right, that was Pentecost. And so Pentecost, as a feast day, saw Jews coming from all over the then known world, which is now the Roman Empire, see? Verse 5, so there were dwelling or abiding at Jerusalem Jews devout men, now watch it, out of every nation under heaven. Well, what was the part of the world under heaven that they're talking about? The Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire went all the way from Spain and across the northern part of the Mediterranean, across the Middle East, Turkey, out through present-day Middle East, and then down around the Mediterranean, down across Egypt and into North Africa. That was all the Roman Empire. There were Jews coming from all those nations throughout the then known world. Now, it stands to reason. When those Jews have been out in these various foreign nations now for two, three, four generations, what language were they speaking? Well, anything and everything but Hebrew. You got me? And now look at the next verse. Verse 6, Now when this was noised abroad, and the multitude came together from every nation under heaven, remember, they were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. Now, goodness sakes, a sixth grader can understand that. In other words, if they came from France, what were they speaking? One of the French dialects. If they came from Syria, what were they speaking? A Syrian dialect. If they came from Timbuktu, they were speaking though. But on the day of Pentecost, what language did they hear it? In their own language. See, that was the miracle of Pentecost. It wasn't an unknown Babel. It was their language that they heard it, see? All right, now what got me off on that? I don't know. Come all the way back to Daniel. Now verse 8. O oh Lord, see how he is pleading in his prayer. O oh Lord. What was the true name for Lord? What were they refraining from saying? Jehovah. See, that's who they were really praying to. O oh Jehovah, to us belongeth confusion of faith, face, to our kings, our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. All right, now let's look at another one so that we get this pounded in at how far these Jews had gone in rebellion against the God of Abraham. Come back with me to Jeremiah 44. We've looked at it before. I always got to remind people I'm getting old, but I'm not senile. I know I've used these many, many times. <laughs> Jeremiah 44, because the reason I use some of these over and over is because they're so plain and simple and explicit. There's just no room for argument. Jeremiah 44, and draw down to verse um, 15, honey. Jeremiah 
44, and we'll drop in at verse 15, because I want you to see how rebellious these covenant people had become. And remember now, we're writing about the time of 600 B.C. All got it? Jeremiah 44, verse 15, Then all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, idols, and all the women who stood by a great multitude, even the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, Hathros, in other words, they had been migrating in and out, and they said to Jeremiah, verse 16, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto you, but we will certainly do whatever thing goes out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven. What was the queen of heaven in antiquity? The most immoral idol worship you can imagine. Athena was one. Uh, Artemis was one in Ephesus. They were all part of that same female uh, deities. See? All right, we've poured out drink offerings unto her as we have done. We and our fathers are, now watch the language, our kings and our princes. See that? And all the cities of Judah and the, Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, for then we had plenty of victuals or food, and we were well and saw no evil. Saw no evil. But, now look at this foolishness. What foolishness. But since we left off burning incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings under her, we have wanted all things. They had it all wrong. What was their problem? They had left off the worship of Jehovah. Oh, they still did temple worship. They went through the motions. But where was their heart? Worshiping these idols. Worshiping these these pagan gods of the Gentile world. And they were totally forgetting Jehovah.